without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the, the two performers today. Uh, the author, um, Liz Rush, and... <laughs> and our pianist today, David Safford. Oh, 
keys and notes fluttered out like a fountain, like raindrops on a puddle, like a warm wind. I played for hours. People said I was very good, a prodigy, a child genius. All I know is that I love to play. When I was practicing, I had one small problem, Wolfgang. He was five years younger than me, so when I started playing, he was only three years old. I adored the little scamp, but he followed me around everywhere. He wouldn't even leave me alone when I practiced. He'd sit at my feet or hide under the clapboard. He'd try to climb onto my lap or squeeze onto the bench beside me and get all tangled up in my skirt. Wolfie. He was so wiggly. <laughs> there was only one way to make him still. I'd play. <laughs> Salzburg and his sister play the harpsichord. The poor little fellow plays marvelously. He is a child of spirit, lively, charming. His sister's playing is masterly, and he applauded her. That was sweet of you, Wolfie. <laughs> when I was ten, we set off on an amazing trip. Our whole family rode in a carriage all around <coughs> Europe on a musical tour. Dukes and duchesses, kings and queens, emperors and empresses gathered in sparkling recital halls and great halls to hear us perform. Enchanting, wonders of nature, child geniuses. That's what the newspaper said. Here's a review of my work from a newspaper in 1763. Just imagine an 11-year-old girl who can perform on the harpsichord or the forte piano, the most difficult sonatas and concertos by the greatest masters, most accurately, readily, and with an almost incredible ease in the very best of taste. Ah, sweet success. Papa was so pleased. He wrote his friends letters saying, My children have taken Europe by storm. Papa could be a little bit competitive. He <laughs> loved bragging about us. My little girl, though she is but 12 years old, is one of the most skillful players in Europe. She plays the most difficult pieces with such unbelievable clarity that the bass showbard cannot recover from his jealousy and envy. <laughs> All I know is that I'd love to play for whomever would listen. Oh, the tour was so wonderful. All four of us in the carriage together playing music wherever we stopped. It was perfection itself. We saw so many beautiful things, castles, courts, cathedrals. We heard so many beautiful concerts. We met so many people, so much royalty. And the gifts, all the gifts we got, rings and fans and even dresses, just like this one. 
But traveling was tiring. The carriage wheel kept breaking and we'd get stuck in the mud. The stew at some of the inns smelled really odd. <laughs> While on tour, Papa got sick, so we moved to a little cottage outside of London so he could recover. Wolfie and I had to be very, very quiet. We were told we couldn't play, not even our instruments. It was torture. To pass time, Wolfie and I would hum to ourselves. One day, he asked if we could write something, a symphony. I got my quill pen and some parchment, and we sat together humming and talking and writing. The house was so silent, but we could imagine a symphony that sounded like laughter, like whispering secrets in three languages, like children at a court dance. It was so good to be home. The carriage was simply loaded down with gifts from the tour. Father Hutner, librarian to St. Peter's Abbey in Salzburg, kindly noted the riches. Papa unpacked. Of gold pocket watches, he has brought home nine. Of gold snuff boxes, he has received twelve. Of gold rings set with the most handsome, precious stones, he has so many that he does not know himself how many. <laughs> Earrings for the girl, necklaces, knives with golden blades, bottle holders, writing tackle, toothpick boxes, and such like gewgaws without number and without end. We saw <coughs> old friends, played with our dog, and continued to play, play music at home and in concerts around Austria. Then, in the winter of 1769, everything changed. Papa loaded up the carriage for another musical tour, this time to Italy the musical center of the world. But Mom and I were left behind. There were many reasons, and no good reasons. Papa said we didn't have enough money. Gold watches and earrings were lovely, but not the same as cash. Plus, I was older, of marriageable age, and Wolfie, the scamp, could still be billed as a child prodigy. Oh, Papa had big plans for Wolfie. He wanted him to be a Kapellmeister, the highest court musician. This wasn't something I would be allowed to do. Back then, there was no such thing as a female composer or performer. In fact, only a handful of women at the time, mainly singers, were professional musicians. <laughs> I would have liked to be one of them. But I stayed home. Wolfie sent funny letters to cheer me up. Rome, praise and thanks be to God. I and my wretched pen are well, and I kiss Mama and Nanner a thousand times. I only wish that my sister were in Rome, for this town would certainly please her. I have had the honor of kissing St. Peter's foot in the St. Peter's Church, and as I have had the misfortune to be so small, I, that same old dance, Wolfgang Mozart, had to be lifted up. <laughs> Wolfie told me everything. Descriptions of a singer's amazing range, some bad trumpet play, playing in Bologna, or a new card game he learned, learned in Rome and promised to teach me. He begged me to write him every day. I sent him some very special things. Since I wasn't performing, I started experimenting <coughs> with music on paper. Rome, my dear sister, I was truly amazed that you can compose so well. In one word, the song you wrote is beautiful. Wolfgang Mozart. Would you like to hear my composition? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry. You'll never be able to hear my music. It has been lost forever. Papa and Wolfie took another trip to Italy the next summer. He met new composers, heard new music, gorgeous Italian operas, and booming concerts in the great cathedral. 